I would love to welcome you, Brian Epps, to the Haight Ashbury Oral Video Project, 60s in Haight Ashbury. Really, really happy that you are here. Um, and uh, I want to ask you a few questions about your early beginnings before we get into the meat of this interview. Sure. Um, my name is Rebecca Nichols, and I'll be your moderator. Um, so I've heard that you're a native Californian. Yeah, I was born at Stanford uh, Medical Hospital when uh, my father was stationed at uh, Moffett Field when they when they were still flying blimps out of there. He was a he was a naval blimp pilot, sort of an esoteric kind of thing, you know. They Very called them helium heads in the in the Navy, you know. But uh, he loved blimps and flew. Right. Them. What year was this about? For it was exactly 1942. Beautiful. And uh, what was your father's name? Marion. Uh, Henry Epps, he was a uh, graduate of the Naval Academy and uh, you know, flew, uh, uh, you know, flew all kinds of aircraft, not, not just blimps. Uh, he was on one of the cruisers during uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor that was out at sea with Halsey's carrier group. Wow. You know, he was a, he was a lifer in the Navy. He was a wonderful man. I really really uh, really miss him, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah, we're honoring him. Away. We're honoring him in this video because you wouldn't be here. That's true. <laughs> and yeah. what was uh, your mother's name? What was... Uh... Her name was Dorothy. Dorothy, uh, and she was, uh, she was quite the gal. She had been, uh, her, her father was a uh, dentist in Long Beach. And, uh, mm -hmm. She actually was born in Canada, and uh, Walter, her, her father, actually adopted father, adopted she and her sister Isabel, who was uh, also quite the lady. She was so she kind of reminded me of the of the dragon lady from uh, <laughs> Terry and the Pirates. Right. You know? She was always mysterious Isabel, woman right? with the with the long cigarette holder, and uh, you know, she smoked. Camels one, one right after the other. I, right. I, I mean, it was just amazing. Uh, she was a wonderful lady, though, and I. Yeah. You so have, it was an interesting kind of family. Sure, it sounds like you had a wonderful beginning. Did you have any brothers and sisters? I have one sister who's living in uh, Riverside now, and her uh, husband is the uh, dean at uh, one of the deans at uh, uh, University of California Riverside. What is your sister's name? Epi. Epi. Evelyn is her real name. Epi is the name that she got when she was in boarding school because she, was... uh, she hated Evelyn. <laughs> name. So she was Epi Epps. Azaretto, actually. Now she's she's she married. Uh, oh, it's gonna long complicated. Story. Sure, anyway. that's her last name now. Yeah, and she's she's a wonderful gal. She. Uh, uh, we we went through a lot of things as being service brats. We went through quite, we had quite a lot. You know, we ended up in. You in touch once in a while. Oh yeah, that's great. All the time. You, know, and you you found someone in your life who, and then had some children. Yeah, uh, yeah, that went back to North Beach. Uh, Katrinka, who was my son Seth's mother, uh, she and I were <clears throat> we lived together for. About seven years, and then ended up getting married, which uh, turned out to be not such a good idea, since we didn't last very long. But we had a good life, and, and uh, he turned out to be pretty good. And then I did discover this is the interesting about the internet sure. thing is that I was sitting um, at the computer doing surfing. I, I there was a while there when I first got hooked up to the net where I just. Man, I was there all the time, you know. So, sure. <laughs> let's go here, let's go there, you know, what's this, what's that? And uh, anyway, so I get a call, and uh, there's this voice at the other end, and it says, uh, are you Brian Epps? And I said, yeah, man, that's me. What are, you, what are you trying to sell me? He says, no, 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 I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm your son, right? Oh, my goodness. That's... And I said, whoa. And, you know, and then I, I went through the whole thing. I Did he have some kind of weird agenda? What was up? He said, no, no, I just want to come down and see you. And when he walked in the door, you know, there was no doubt. It was like seeing myself, you know. Right. 
And, and the first thing he said to me is, you want to smoke a J? <laughs> and I said, that's my son. <laughs> <laughs> and what's his name? What's his name? His name is Rob. So you have a, a son named Seen and a son Seth. named Seth and a Seth son named Seth. Rob. Rob and, and what do they do in their lives now? Do, are they interested? Well, in Seth them? is a, he's an avid uh, snowboarder, you know, devil. Sure. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the, uh, no, no risk is too great a risk. Right, right, you know? exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let me jump off of a hundred foot mountain. On right, snow. right. Uh, and he's married and living up in Reno and I, Last time I knew he was he was being a being a chef. Um, I don't know whether he's doing that now. Sure. Or not, but, uh, and then Rob is a he's a painter, really an excellent painter. Wow. And uh, he's, he's living up in the North Country, up in uh, Arcata. And so he's a happy camper up there. Super. And, That's wonderful. And so, I'm living in Marin. I'm and you're of, living in Marin at present. I'm sort of in the middle. Or, and here we are in 2005. And I'm going to take you on a spaceship and bring you back to the 1960s. Uh, and I'm asking you, when do you remember first seeing H Street? Uh, Lord have mercy, when was it? Approximately. Yeah, it was It was probably, I, I think it was like 1959 or wow. 60s, somewhere in there. Because there was like a, there was a, a, a tribe of lesbians that lived in the, in the, here in the Hague, and they had they had uh, LSD, the world's best LSD, the Sandoz kind. You know, there was, there was uh, the. Uh, so, what year did you first start taking LSD? It was approximately maybe 1960, 61, somewhere wow. in that. That's way early. About so the you, same time that Leary was uh, experimenting with Harvard. Yeah, and, and in fact, some of that. Some of those experimental things sort of managed to find their way west. Right. Mysteriously, we never figured out why. But <laughs> right. So, it sounds to me you came again to Haight Street. When did you first start living in Haight Ashbury? Well, let me see. In, okay, it was kind of a weird story. In 64, 60, 63, I was discharged from the Navy for muscular dystrophy. And he gave me a medical discharge, and I saw I was put loose and fancy free, and I went to work for Bank of America, thinking that I was going to be a up and coming banker and stuff, and just got bored to death. And somebody turned me on to some acid one night, and I said, "You know, this bank thing is kind of not much fun." <laughs> and uh, then, you know, there was like a lot of people experimenting. It was it was it was weird. It was like some kind of psychic network where all these people were experimenting with these different light things, you know, and then... It, Do you remember who some of these people were you were hanging out with in the pre-pre-early light shows? Well, in the early days, it was pretty much my, uh, me and Bob Pullum, who was a companion spirit. Uh, he'd been up here in 66, and uh, he was trying to find a straight gig and never found one. Then came back to Stockton, and we ran into each other. You know, we were like like like, like spirits because sure. we were experimenting with all different sure. kinds of things. And then we, sometime in that period of time, it, it's all kind of cloudy. Sure. Uh, <laughs> you remember more than most, so it's uh, okay. But uh, what were the kind of things you were experimenting with? Film. Did yeah, we were doing film, and, and one of the oh, I'll never forget this. This was we had this. Uh, Dance, it was called a dance studio. It was in, in Stockton, right? And I was dating the girl whose mother owned the place. And we started, we, we called it, what did we call it? The Place, right? Is what we called it. And we were having, we'd have these weekly dances. And we had these two overhead projectors. And we had no glassware except we took the, the, the cover plates off of TVs. Wow. You know, the, the protective thing that sure. protects the tube. Sure. Took them off and we had them on a large piece of glass, right? Well, there was all wonderful. It worked great, except one one night, while we were do, right in the middle of this, while we're doing it, it got so hot that the glass cracked, right? And I'm looking in horror, you know, as part of the glass in the strobe light is going down to the floor, you know. 
Oh I'm my like, goodness. Uh oh. We gotta find a better way, right? So it was just like it was stuff like that, you know. And another thing that was really cool too was Bob had invented this really wonderful bubble machine, right? It was like a he took parts of a swamp cooler and put the, these huge rotors in there that had all those little paddles for bubbles. Sure. And it was just wonderful in the strobe light, except it would get down on the floor. Everybody would whomp, you know. Slide. <laughs> Slip it and slide, oh, you know. Just an uh, early, early bubble machine. That yeah, and, and it now, was yes. like, a, uh, but everybody forgave us, you know. Sure. It was like, it was... Uh, Experimental time. Experimental, you know. It was like how did how did do you remember how the idea uh, for the plates that people used? Well, I, that's quite simple. We came. I saw Bill Ham. I came to San Francisco, and Bill Ham was doing show somewhere. Maybe it was at the. Oh God, I don't know. I can't remember. But I saw him doing it, and here he was, you know, up on this platform, surrounded by beautiful women. Rock and roll music, you know, everybody's loving him, and I'm saying, I want to be there. That's it! <laughs> I want to do that! Right. And, uh, yeah, so it was like, it, it kind of, uh, that was the inspiration, and uh, then I went on a search uh, all over California to find plates, to, to find the plates, and I... Tell us about the plates, because people listening to this all right. um, okay. don't, well, under, don't know about this. When you do liquid projections, what you have is you have... You can have as many as three plates, but but normally what you have is you have a large, like a 16-inch plate that's a bottom plate. You put liquid, you know, which is oil and, and water and, and uh, isopropyl alcohol in this plate. And then you have another plate that's probably 12 inches in diameter that you use to manipulate the liquid in the bottom so plate. So one goes on top of the other. One goes on top and of the other. And on the bottom plate is a mixture of an oil pigment color yeah. with mineral oil. Yeah. And then you're oil. using water dyes yeah. on top of that. Is that correct? And then That's the right. second plate is sandwiched. And by manipulating the second plate, you're able to... Yeah. And when you really begin to understand the liquid, you you realize that you can use the surface tension of the plate to actually manipulate the liquid without really even touching the bottom of the plate. Yeah. We used to do this kind of like Zen exercise to see you know, who could do, go through a show without ever touching the bottom of the plate. But about and the if color you did, you got fine five bucks. Right. <laughs> so I saw that. I've heard yeah, that like, <laughs> light show artists have very strong muscles in their arms because you don't realize how, what hard work that is. Yeah, oh moving. man, I'm telling you, it would get you in the shoulders like all, all night long. Sometimes the dead would play, and I, I remember at Fillmore one time, the dead played so long that I fell asleep, standing up, you know, <laughs> doing like a wind side. And uh, it was like they would they would go on until like 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning, you know, and, and uh, they'd say, okay, just one more song, right? And, you know, three hours later, everybody would go, wow, you know, and then they'd launch into something else. Sure. Yeah, do, you, was, uh, do you remember in those days some of the other people that work with you? Any other people help you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, man. We, uh, Names that we should know about, not be forgotten? Well, Bob Pullum, who was my partner in Stockton, and uh, is now uh, in Smart Boy. He's on the Big Island. Uh, uh, Hawaii. Hawaii, doing light shows there. And, you know, it's, he's living in a real kind of small community, which is great. You know, it sounds like... He's managed to find the 60s there. Is that right? <laughs> and uh, Mark Maxman, who was one of the, who originally had the gig at the Strait Theater. Uh, what was his light show? Do you remember what it was called? It was called Aerial Transit. Is what Aerial it was Transit. Called. What it was, was it, it was, a, what had happened is that Mark had been working with Roger Van Meter from North American Ibis Alchemical, and they had a, they split the sheets, as they say. And uh, so Mark ended up with about eight carousels. And we had overheads, these hot rod overheads that we put together. And uh, so we came into the Strait Theater one night and uh, just arrived with all our equipment. We said, we're here. <laughs> and uh, I, I can't ever remember being so absolutely <laughs> terrified in my life. You know, I said, what happens? Here we are, we pulled all the plugs on everything. You know, I've given up my house, I've given up everything, and I've got a little bit of money. 
here we are in San Francisco, you know, like, oh boy. When, when was this about what year? This was 1967. It was, uh, it was actually after the, after the main madness and, you know, the summer of love. Right after that. It was right after When that. you appeared with Death the Straight, did they let you go up and set up and... And yeah, in fact, you know, it, I thought about that, is that the timing seemed to be just, you know, I heard somebody describe it, I don't know who it was, but it was like somebody picked up all these rocks and all of a sudden all these people popped up. Bloop, 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 bloop. Okay, let's go, you know. It's and funny. it's sort of as if we all knew what to do, you know, although we had no clue. Exactly. You know? And it, uh, it was... Uh, so as you see it, do you remember your first light show at the Street Theater? Do you remember uh, sort of one of the first yeah, ones? Yeah, we, we... You were doing oil projection with overheads? Yeah, we were doing... You were oil. doing slide projectors? Uh, well, oh. actually, we were kind of weak in that department. Our what men, about films? You were doing me, film Me loops? and Bob, our, our, our thing was liquids. You know, liquids. Because uh, I know in those days they did a 16 millimeter, they would use a film loop to, that would play yeah. over itself over and over again. Yeah, and I, I was just, I was just telling Louise that... Uh, we had uh, these machines that they were like these old school type uh, 16 millimeter projectors. Uh, Steve Goldsmith had some too. Mm -hmm. And they called them choppers that we did because what they would do is sometimes if you did get them threaded right and you were trying to thread them on the fly, uh, they would uh, uh, just, right. oh, yeah. it would just chew, not only would it they break would it, it, but it would like just go chick, 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 all these you know, you'd have these little pieces of celluloid about this long, right? And, uh, but uh, then, you know, gradually as, as and we had these other, I'd love to know what happened to these things, but they were like these theater uh, projectors that had these long snoots on them. They were made by Kodak. And you could extend this lens and you could get a, like a, like a 10 inch, focal length, which is bright on the wall because it, it had a thousand watt bulb in it. Right? right. So we had a bunch of these and uh, I just always thought I was lucky. So I... pretty much when you had either an overhead or or a projector, it was really a matter of the lensing and the light. You yeah. know, if you had good lensing, you would have a good throw and the light would then take whatever you were doing and project it up on the screen sheet or whatever it was. Yeah, so, so our saving grace was the fact that we had these uh, absolutely stellar machines that had these two uh, real glass plano convex lenses, nine inch units you know, back to back. Everything in it was was glass and it was built like a tank. It was built, these things were built in 1939, right? Wow. And, you know, they were... Uh, most expensive thing to replace is a light bulb, right? You know, no, 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 actually, the, the lens. lens. The I, lens. I, in fact, right after that candle box tour, I cracked one of my lenses in one of the other ogres, and I've just been frantic. I don't know where to find another lens. I'm sure one will show up somewhere. Totally. Uh, I think that the, we'll yeah, talk later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. Uh, but uh, that Listen, was it. There was an element because we didn't have video yet. People were playing around with old 8mm movies and cutting them up, 16mm, and there was something, mirrors, mirrors reflected, and... all, yeah. all the period was filled with experimenting, experimenting on every level of light and lensing and projection to get it out there, and then there was an element in film. Oh yeah, film was really... That is very different than... Today we have light shows, 2005. It's very different having video mixing, and oh, yeah, and this is totally now. But in the 60s, a whole other feeling of film being and projected then, on, on top of oils, layering, overlaying, uh, a soft kind of feeling. Um, I remember seeing dancers dancing mm -hmm. over the oils and the loop going on and on, where yeah. video is a whole other... Uh, Media. Yeah, it's, you know, what a lot, a lot of what I've seen is real hard edged, and, and I mean it's sort of appropriate for the time. Like sure, this. sure, sure. But uh, you know, to me, there's nothing more more uh, sensual than really good liquids. I mean, if it's you know, if it's bright and colors are clear, and you know, you got the right setup, it's just it's like being in another world. And try not to make brown. <laughs> try not. Yeah, right. Exactly. 
and, and you know, just clarity. What are some of the colors you could get? Well, if, oh, if somebody God. was looking, walked in the straight theater and looking up on the screen and you were doing your oils and it's in, the, in what you were proud of in the best, what were some of the colors that you would see come off of this on the walls? Oh, Imagine a color. <laughs> Imagine a color. So like bright. Uh, ultraviolets and, you know, all, ultramarines and ceruleums and, you know, all Fuchsia those. Fuchsia and chartreuse and All those turquoises. colors, you know, those, those kind of colors, the ones that really grab you. So when you really think about it, when you're a child and you're learning primary colors, yellow, blue, red, the whole idea of oils and lights comes back to understanding what happens with color when it overlays on another color. Yeah. So and it's an art form. In it's a the, different. It, well, it's a different beast too in the fact that you know if you if you mix red and yellow, to well you, you're still on an overhead you'll still get that color, but it's. It's like a, a different kind of thing. It's like a, it's like a reflected color rather than a, a, a opaque. Uh, a, a, a like opaque colors, yeah. Sure. And it, it's. A, <laughs> but uh, then, if you added, if you had a blue and a red, you'd have a a purple. Yeah. But depending if it overlaid on a yellow again, at the, it would somehow change in certain areas. So if you had a double plate or a triple plate, you're able to play with so much. You yeah, know. the problem with the triple thing is you've got to be really good in order to manipulate three plates. Two is really, yeah. Uh, you know, what what difference could you get from three plates than you would from two? Just it's just the amount of, they're good for like background static kind of stuff, you know, where you could get like, say you could put a yellow on the top plate and then you'd have like a, like a, a clear oil and a red and one and then in the bottom would be like a blue and, a, and, and clear. You know, or blue and red, or whatever, and as as the colors sort of interreacted, they would like subtract from each other. Right, you get the you know, and you get these. I mean, it's just it, it's really impossible to kind of describe. It's like like describing the northern lights. Exactly. You know, like, did you ever? Did you ever? Some of the early light show artists painted their own slides. Oh uh, yeah, that was. Uh, did you ever? You oh, ever try yeah. to experiment with that a little bit? In fact, we had. Oh man, we had the greatest house when we went to work for Bill at the at the uh, uh, Fillmore West. We finally had some money, you know. And we rented this great old house out on Ninth Avenue, and we had like one of those little rooms in the back where they had a laundry sink in it, and that was our paint room because the uh, paint that, that you put on those slides is like. Whew, you know, toluene, you know, heavy duty uh, stuff would just knock you into next right. week. You know? Right. Right. Give me a lot of inhalation. You smoke a joint on top of it. You know? <laughs> of come back, come back. <laughs> but so, uh, yeah, that was uh, that was a lot of fun. And uh, then there was a whole period where people were doing their own, you know, codalis, <laughs> stark black and white. Our thing was always, you know, no corners, no no sharp edges. You know, everything should should flow flow together. You know? Gotcha. And uh, do you remember doing a light show um, on Hate Street? Do you remember doing a light show at the Strait? Oh, I sure do. Do you remember who might be playing on the stage? Well, it seemed like you know we were as Hillel described the chance. You know when, when Santana was there. Sure. It seemed like uh, you know that. I mean, we kind of jokingly said, well, it's great to have a practice band, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, uh, anyway. Uh, I just am very uh, curious. There was like a, a, a wide variety. Like one I remember really well was uh, was this crazy group called Fermius Bandersnatch. That was, uh, it was I, I believe they, they were headquartered here in the Hague. Yeah. Uh, I know the and then Clover, which is the group that uh, used to open for Quicksilver, and they were, and, and Huey Lewis was in that. That's group. right. He was. That's right. With long hair and a beard. Yeah. That's and, right. Uh, so, it, yeah, there were a lot of groups that passed through there, and I'm telling you, at that particular time in our career, uh, we were probably so dosed most of the time right. that. that uh, it just sort of seemed like this flowing... Well, just drop a few names. This is the place to drop it. Uh, uh, any of the venues you worked uh, and did light shows. Well, can, can the you, film, can, I mean... Tell me, it doesn't matter where, just tell me some names you know, of uh, bands that you did light Jesus, shows for. There was for. Chuck Berry. We even worked with uh, 
the, the craziest one was Buck Owens and his Buckaroos. <laughs> and, uh, if they were trying to do a light show to a country western band. That was interesting. <laughs> uh, uh, there was, uh, and the most incredible night that I ever can think of was when Miles Davis played with Grateful Dead, right? There were all these dead ends here, and Miles came out on the stage, and he had, first of all, he had a white bass player. And I said, hippie bass player, and I said, something's up. And that was during the Bitches Brew period. I forget what date it was. But he came out there, and these dead ends were like, whoa. You know, they were just completely blown away by Miles Davis. They just, you know, went, wow. Exactly. <laughs> you know? exactly. And it was, it was an incredible gig. Uh, and then after that, uh, me and Ed went off to Mexico for a while. Uh, and there was kind of like a misunderstanding at the time because we went to take photographs and he thought we were splitting the set. You know, anyway. I have was, a question. I've heard your name associated with Brother of Light. Yes. Well, Can you? We have. We, we're closing up right now, and I'm going to invite you back for your yeah. wealth of information. Um, tell me some of the beginnings of Brotherhood of Light. Well, that, right now we're in the third generation of Brother, Brotherhood of Light. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, so, somewhat quickly, if you could tell me a little bit about Brotherhood of Light. Well, what it? We did a show. Me, Mark, and Bob did a show up at in Sebastopol, and. Uh, we, we had been reading the Brotherhood of Light tarot book. Oh, there is a okay. Church of Light. Gotcha. And, the, and it's like these lessons in... in yes, I know the book, yes. Okay. So we said, duh, we're brothers. We do light shows. You know, why not the Brotherhood of Light? Ding! You know, right, like, exactly. Yes, <laughs> that's it. That's and it was like, it, it beat the hell out of aerial transit, which was kind of, I don't know, we had this thing about, you know, how the molecules of light were being transmitted aerially, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. You know. <laughs> it's, <laughs> amazing. it's amazing. It's uh, amazing. So I know that Brotherhood of the Light is still going on right now, and I think a relative of yours is involved with it. Am I correct or not? There's, well. Right now it's uh, Peter and, and you No, know, it's Chris, just Pe it's Peter and Chris basically right. doing it. I, I believe the last time I heard was from... Uh, they were working with Almond Brothers. They were working with Nature with the um, Almond Brothers. I don't know whether that's true or not. Yeah, but they, it is. Yeah. They hung in there for, geez, they've been doing it for like 12 years. Exactly. Or something like that. Exactly. And it was basically in 85, was uh, Eddie, who was another member of the, of the thing, sold it off. Uh, sold off the Brotherhood without yeah. my knowing it. I, but I was up blazing in the hot springs up in Harvard, so what did I know? Right. You know, I was but, but forever we have this tape. And as we're closing, I, I want to thank you so much for being here sure. because I think a lot of the people that are watching this in the future don't even know what glass plates are, know what light shows are. And uh, I, I want to thank you for being here, for being part of the scene. The scene was a lot of people contributing um, to make it oh, what yeah. it was, it was, it was to uh, make it what it was, and just real quickly, I'm going to ask you: If somebody saw this tape in the future, what would you want young people to get about what you lived through and what you, in 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 one sentence, what would you want people to get about the period, the creativity, the family? Just to to you know, look on the bright side. Be you know, <laughs> to quote uh, Monty Python, uh, you know, be positive. Uh, be positive, yeah. I mean, it's like, come on, you know, you've got this beautiful thing called life, you know, live it for heaven's sakes, you know. That's basically it. And that was what the whole light show thing was about was, you know, if you think you've seen color, look at this, you know. And that was always our, you know, it, with music, it, you know, it was just like, I can remember times of being just absolutely transported, you know, and just being... Sure. You know, felt like I was bouncing around among them. But your work and your contr contributing to what you did as lifestyles and work, whatever, made everybody else feel like that. And that was the gift that kept on giving through the 60s that what made the whole scene happen with hundreds and thousands of people. Yeah. And we're really honored to have you here today. We want to thank you so <laughs> much for this. And we will be asking you back. And I just want to thank you so much. For, well, that's cool. I'm for being here and sharing and uh, 
and continuing to inspire. And thank you so much, Brian. Well, it was a great day. I was glad to see those maniacs, uh, Hillel and, and Luther. I hadn't seen them in, oh golly, since 68, yes. I don't know, 69, whenever, whenever Fillmore West opened up. I know. It's a historical day, and we want to thank you so much. Good. Thank you so much, uh, Brian. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. I always love coming to the Hayden, especially on a sunshiny day. Exactly. <laughs>